first one was thank you that the boards have just come together to do this. Mm -hmm. We've got one mission all the way up in Reading, all the way back there. So we are so thankful. And we just pray a blessing on her as she delivers to the people right now. Amen. Amen. Okay. Hello, a little bit smaller than that. Hi, I'm Dora. So this is the day for me. Um, yeah, I feel like God's gonna do stuff through this message before because I had a real battle last night. I know that happens before something good. So expect God to do something cool, not because I'm amazing, because He's amazing. And we're gonna talk about the Bible, so there's always change in my happiness as well. So, um, today I'm talking about the topic of joyful embrace. Um, when I'm nervous, I sometimes talk quickly. I'm sorry if I do that. If you're watching this back later, you might want to slow it down a bit. Um, <laughs> I will try my best. Um, so, we're in a series called Joyful Dot Dot Dot, and today we're looking at Joyful Embrace. And I thought I'd do this by looking at, if you go to the next slide, um, as a church, we look often at this. Um, up in out of thoughts, up our relationship with God, like looking at Him in how He interacts with us, and then out how we overflow. So I thought I'd use that as sort of a basis for this talk. Um, so we're going to start with up, and the reason we're going to start with up is because if you're thinking of a joyful embrace, I want to know that the embrace that's in heaven is one that I want to be part of, that's one that's already got joy in it, and one that's got space. And desire for me to be part of it. So I've got to start off by painting a picture of the joyful embrace that's in heaven. And to do that, I'm going to talk about a topic that isn't necessarily what you think about when you think of joyful embrace, which is the Trinity. And that's basically the idea that God is one, but also three, makes Christianity unique from all religions. And basically, um, the reason that that's joyful embrace is to show this joy between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. So I'm just going to paint a picture of what that um, what that looks like. That that embrace is one. Obviously, we haven't been able to have so many embraces recently for obvious reasons. But a good embrace, a good hug, is one where you feel safe and loved. It's not a quick one; it's a long one. Um, it's one where you don't feel like you're hiding anything from the other person. And sometimes when you're known and you're safe and you're loved and you're resting, you might share secrets with each other, you might share plans with each other, you might even be able to hear the other person's heartbeat, and the other things in the world don't matter so much. And somehow you have this connection that makes you feel more whole beat that word. So that's kind of what we're going to look at. Um, and looking, some of you will know loads more than me about everything I'm talking about today. And some of you will have never heard any of it before, but by the grace of God, I believe you can give all of us a fresh revelation. I've definitely learned a lot myself. Um, if for no one else, this preacher's helped me a lot this last week. <laughs> um, so uh, if we skip two slides on to the picture of the book. So um, this book, I highly recommend. If you want to understand the Trinity a bit more and why that actually should be joyful, this book is amazing. It's thin, it's good, easy to read, incredible book. And I've stolen some of the thoughts where I'm about to share from this. Um, so, why does the Trinity matter in an embrace? Well, if God is primarily a creator, if that's his first definition, then before he's created anything, he doesn't really have a definition because how can you be a creator? Make it in the same way, so he kind of needs to create it before he gets his meaning. But God isn't only the creator, that is what he does, he's also a father, okay. And he's a father again, needs to have definition, needs to have children. But the son was before everything, so you've got the father in the beginning, and in the beginning of the Bible, the first words are in the beginning, God, and you've got God the father in the beginning. And it also, in John, says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word is just another word for Jesus. So you're saying there's God the Father in the beginning, and even before he made us as his children, he was already a father, because you have the Son at the beginning as well. That's two. And then third, in Genesis, it also says the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So you've got all three. 
Father, Son, and Spirit. And the way they interact with each other is one of love. And they are one and three. And that is confusing, but you can ask God to reveal more to you, and, and he will. Um, but I want today to focus on the fact that they really love each other and really enjoy being with each other. Um, so if we skip to the next slide, I've got some pictures of some hugs. Um, most of them are from Google. <laughs> And this is actually three people. Behind there is the third person. So it's three people having a hug. Um, and we're going to look at those three and more in a minute. But representing three people having a hug. It's quite hard on people to get a free hug, can I just say? If you try it, it's not very easy. Um, yeah. So you've got God and Jesus. And if we want to know how they feel about each other, in when Jesus was walking around on earth, um, the night before he was betrayed, uh, uh, so the night he was betrayed, before he was killed, and he's in the garden, and he's desperate and sad and overwhelmed and, and afraid, and he's, you know, praying. And he says, and he's praying to his father, and he's praying for us, which is incredible. He's praying for us when he's really struggling. He says, um, he asks that God would let the world know that you, Father, sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. So when he's trying to say this is what love looks like, it's the way the father has loved the son. There's a huge amount of love there. And he says, the love you have for, he asks that the love you have for me may be in them. There's such love between the father and the son. When the son gets baptized, when Jesus gets baptized, um, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible because it used to make me laugh, because um, it's a beautiful picture, he gets baptized, and then the Holy Spirit comes down on him to show the favour of God to those around, physically rests on him. And then God the Father says, this is my son with whom I'm very pleased. Or the translations often say, with whom I'm well pleased. So um, that's that favour of God. So you've got in that moment, you've got God the Father demonstrating favour through the Spirit to the Son. And um, just talking about the Holy Spirit for a minute. Sometimes um, the language in the Bible can be made it very easy to think of Holy Spirit almost like an element because you have the fire of God and the wind of God and like the, he's described like water and like a dove. And you think, okay, well, is it the Father and Son hugging a dove? Like, how does that work? But actually, those are just parts of how we interact with the Holy Spirit. Just like Jesus is described as the Word, he's not just a Word walking around. That's how he's described. He's also described as the arm of God, part of his personality. And actually, Holy Spirit is also part of the person of God. We know this because Holy Spirit can teach us. We can offend Holy Spirit. So these help us see that we can interact with him as a person. And actually, although he might refresh us like water and fire us up like fire and bring us peace like a dove, actually he's part of the person of God, and sometimes when I've worked in a school before and tried to describe to teenagers what um, what Holy Spirit is like, it's almost like if God's um, the Father is like a teacher at the front, and the student has no idea what the teacher's talking about, absolutely none, and then the teaching assistant comes and explains in language that the student can then understand, that's more like what Holy Spirit does. It doesn't tell us anything different from what the Father's saying, but it helps us understand it sometimes and find it tricky to understand. So, Holy Spirit is part of that trinity, part of that hub that we're being welcomed into um, here. Okay, well, fine, you might say, lovely, there's a hub in heaven, happy days. Um, there's already three of them, where's my space? Mm -hmm. Like, they're complete, there's a complete hub. And um, what about me? We'll go to the next slide. Okay, so this is how we're welcomed in. This is how it is. Um, if you notice here, this is where, those of you who went to talk last time, this was the part where Jesus was son, the Spirit. And when Jesus came, when the, when the Father and the Son chose for Jesus to come, it was consensual that the Son was sent and like, oh, don't send me if you wanted to go. When he sent, it opened the arms so that we could come in as well. What used to be closed has become open. 
Not because I'm really good and come closer and closer when they're not looking, snuck inside. Okay, it's not sneaky, it's not because you're nosy, it's because the father and son want to welcome us in. There's now a space for us to be inside that embrace. A space where in that embrace you are called to be loved, to know what it is to be surrounded by the love of these three persons who love each other so much that you can't not feel loved in that moment. And um, that's kind of where we go from the up into the in. And this hug now has rest in a world where, I don't know about your lives, I've spoken to a few of you, there's a lot of striving, there's a lot of business in our lives. Um, sometimes there's mental exhaustion and emotional exhaustion. There's bereavement, there's mental health crisis. I work in school, I've worked in schools for years, and there's a huge mental health crisis amongst teenagers. And it's not unique to teenagers, adults do. Anxiety, depression, it's gone through the roof since COVID. And yet in this hub is the place where we can just rest. We can cease to strive. We can feel wanted here in a life where maybe we feel rejected. Maybe we feel like we're never enough, or maybe we feel like we're too much. Um, maybe in friendships, we never feel fully safe. This is a place where we are always wanted, not because of what we have to offer, but because they have opened their arms to welcome us. We are known and seen and loved. I'm going to talk a bit more about what that means practically in a minute. And we get to hear the voice of God. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm awful at eavesdropping. If people are near me and talking, um, and it sounds interesting, I will listen. I'm um, just a warning to you. And um, if they're talking about interesting things, if we're really close and stopping our busy minds, we'll be able to hear what their plans are. And again, we're going to talk about that in a minute. So it's the hug we long for, and it's not quick, it's long, we feel safe. And we feel loved. Okay, can you go down two slides for me? I love this painting. Have you ever seen these paintings before? By an author called Chai Magazine, who did um, that book, The Mole, The Boy, The Fox, and The Horse. Yeah, some of you have seen some of it. Here's the beautiful paintings. This is called The Prodigal Son and The Prodigal Daughter. Um, so you might guess a bit the Bible about it, okay? Um, but we're going to look at this at the Bible, and I know that a couple of weeks ago, Richard and Eve mentioned in his talk about identity um, this story, and I highly recommend if you haven't already heard his talk from that evening, do. The link was sent out in the email. If, like me, you didn't notice that, and maybe you need to ask him for the link, he's very gracious and was sent to the link. Um, so I highly recommend that. There's so much good stuff in this story. I won't cover even a fraction of it. Um, I recommend spending more time in the story and just focusing on the embrace at the end. But uh, Tim Keller's Critical God is very good on the topic as well. So um, I'm reading from Luke 15. You can follow along if you want, or just close your eyes and see what God's talking to you about in the story. See what sticks out to you. Because it might be what God speaks to you about. There's nothing what I'm saying today, and it's just a throwaway verse in the story. That's okay. I'm very happy for us to talk about anything with you today. So you can follow it with 15 verse 11, if you like, or you can just listen. So this is the story. Um, it's called The Parable of the Lost Son. But in more recent years, people think you may be noticing there are two sons who are equally lost in different ways in the story. So it's sort of two more sons. Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of this set. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to, be a, to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to be pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. 
I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattening calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. But this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother is come. He replied, and your father has filled the fattened cup, and he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your order. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. Or when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes has come home, you killed the fattened cup for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we have to celebrate, have a glass, because this brother of yours is dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. So we've got those, those two brothers, and we're going to look at the lost son first and then the other brother afterwards. So the younger brother he gets himself in this crazy place where he, he's with his dad and he says, Dad, I'd rather you were dead so I can write this stuff and go and do a writing. And I'll just go and do what I want because I think what I know is better than what you know and I'll be happy. And he does, and it doesn't make him happy. Shocker. So um, it's so easy to judge him, but I do this sort of thing. Maybe not to that extreme, but I think that I'm going to make him happy. I think that maybe what God's asking me to do or calls us to do in the Bible sounds like hard work sometimes, or it sounds like not the thing that the world tells us makes us happy. It could be a really obvious thing or it could be a much smaller thing. But he comes to this place where it says he comes to his senses. And that's what repentance is around. It's about coming to our senses. It's about thinking one way. His thoughts were, I need to meet my own needs. I think I know what makes me happy. And these things will make me happy. And the, my friends will support me and give me what I need. And when I spend my money, I'll get with it. And actually, he gets this point of desperation and he changes his mind. He's like, oh, my dad is much better than this. My dad even treats his servants better than these people treat me. And he changes his mind from one way and like changes to the other way. And that's what repentance is. It's not about saying sorry, it's about literally changing his thinking. He once thought this, he's now changed his face and he's thinking something different. And he's going to go back to his dad and he's going to confess. He's going to say, What I've done isn't okay, and I'm no longer willing to be with you, can I be your servant? And as he goes back, that repentance, that turning around is enough. And then got the father who represents God, that runs, which in that culture, you know, not, not what one would do. And he just embraces. His son, and his son tries to get out the words and he practiced, you know, when we practice what we're going to say in advance. Um, and he practiced it. And, but before he said to his dad, make me like one of your hard servants, the dad stopped. The dad didn't want a hard servant. The dad wants his son. When we come back to God after doing things that we've repented from, sometimes we feel we then have to earn our way back. Well, it's not interested in that. The father wasn't interested in that. He's interested in his son. And in fact, it's significant that he put shoes on the son's feet because I mean, slaves went barefoot, barefoot, but sons were short, sons were short shoes. He's saying, you're my son, you're not a slave. Um, and the idea of confessing, saying what we've done isn't okay, is one that, um, I find it scary, I don't know about you, but to admit what I've done isn't okay makes me feel afraid that I will be 
Um, no longer worthy of love, and that people judge me as needing to be separated. It's not about, um, yeah, it makes me afraid that when I say that I've done something big wrong, that I need help with it, it makes me feel like, oh, but if I admit that, I like that son's expectation of the father lead to the earn my way back in. And yet, um, in 1 John 1, verse 9, there's this promise. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim to have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. So actually it brings a much more honour and connection to confess our sins. And um, often when we've done something we're ashamed of, um, we feel like, again, it's that separation. In the Garden of Eden, there was Adam and Eve, and they sinned, and their instant reaction was to hide. And not only did they physically hide from God, as though that would work, um, they also made themselves little clothes out of leaves. Now, just imagine a leaf today, nice and fresh. What's going to happen in a couple of days for that leaf? It'll get a bit, yeah? And then after a few more days, it's not going to be much good for cover in the long term, so. And that's what we do. We try and cover our sin with short-term solutions. But God, in the Garden of Eden, made a long-term solution. He did the first killing of an animal that was recorded and killed and blood was shed so that they could have their sin covered in a long-term way. And that's what the blood of Jesus does for us. That we try to cover our sin with little good behaviours and apologies, actually, if we confess to God, he cleanses us and with Jesus' blood, what Jesus did, we can then receive that and be covered. Now, that doesn't mean behavior doesn't need to change, and it doesn't mean, like, Adam and Eve did have to then leave the God in that situation before Jesus. And there are still um, consequences, but the connection can still be there. And this isn't just about confessing to God. But sometimes we need to confess to other people. And in James 5, it says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And um, this probably won't be your favourite part of the message, um, but I think it's a very powerful one. Because there's things in our lives that we do that people don't know about and that maybe people should know about. And I think it's really important that we are accountable for things. So for me, myself, um, I haven't got it all sorted, my life isn't perfect, and I don't always make the right choices, and I need help. And so I am accountable to Richard and Catherine. So I talk to them, and I'm accountable to them, because there's stuff in my life I need to be honest with. And they, in turn, are not perfect, and don't always make perfect choices. And they are also accountable to other people. It's not that you get to some level of Christianity where you no longer need to be accountable with anything. The more mature I've become, the more I realise I can't be self-reliant as much as I would like to. So can I highly recommend, if there's some things in your life right now, you're like, well, it's probably not that bad. That's definitely my mantra for things I do. Oh, does it matter? Oh, it's not that bad. Still, tell people. It might be something small. It might be just a hard attitude that you're like, oh, I really don't think this is like honouring God. I don't think this is time. And it might be something that was from years ago that you never told someone, or it might be something you do regularly. It might be something that feels like it's an addiction, or it might be just the way that you find you judging people in your heart and you don't know how to stop. It's okay, we are meant to be part of the community confessing some of the that's actually happening, but that's our mission community leaders. But that's just a Christian who's more mature than you, who you respect, someone who's not afraid to call you out on it, but still show you love. Um, and um, it can feel scary to confess because you think, well, what if they don't respond like in a loving way? And I'm sorry if that's been your experience. Um, for me, I used to never want to tell that people things if I've done something wrong. And then about 10 years ago, I went to the school of supernatural ministry, and there was this amazing woman who she's just incredible and she ran the course, and during that year. I made some choices in a relationship that were not good choices. And I was going down to the free side. And I was like, it's fine, it's fine, it's not good, it's not good. Well, I've got that sorted. Anyway, in my small group, it came out, and my small group leader was like, probably need to tell Wendy this lady. And I was like, oh, 
And I was petrified. She was like, mm, you yeah, know, she probably should have the course. That's, you know, what I thought she'd say. And, um, and I told her, and she thanked me for telling her and just showed me such love and grace that I was like, it, it just changed for me the way I thought God would interact with me, which was incredible. Now, don't get me wrong, I had to change a few things. I had to put some boundaries in place. I had to change the way I was interacting with this particular person. Um, and it was really painful. But I didn't have to do it alone. I wasn't someone who had to get my life sorted so I could come back. I was someone who was part of an army, part of a team, and together we were growing towards God. So that was amazing. So can I highly recommend that you talk um, to a relevant person? Um, basically, are you going to allow anything in your life to stop you from enjoying the hug that's on offer? Um, because if you're fully known, the hug is so much better than if you've got a mask on. Um, Second son, elder son, very different. His response to the father is very different. Interestingly, you notice the father had to go out to both sons. Both sons required the father to act. And the elder son thought of himself. The language he uses, he says he's slaved to his father. And sometimes you can be able to go, I've slaved for you, I've served you, I've read the Bible, I've been kind to people, I've prayed, I've given money to the church, and I do good things and I don't know what other amazing things that you do in your life that are well worth doing. Um, what the older son was doing is well worth doing, but his attitude, he missed the point. He thought, if I do these things, my dad will give me something so I can go up there and have fun with my friends. My dad owes me. And instead, the whole amazing thing about his dad was that his dad loved him. And so often we miss the point. And the point is, God is our father and we're welcomed into this, this embrace, this love. And um, he'd miss the point. And maybe you, maybe you miss the point. It's definitely times when I have. And just again, confessing, God, I thought that it was like this. I thought it was about me doing the right thing and being good and having it all together. And I'm, I'm sorry, because actually the way I come into the heart is because of what you've done and, and not what I've done. And um, I don't know about you, but if I was having to talk to one of those two brothers about something I'd done that wasn't okay, I definitely know which, son, which brother I think would meet me with more grace and more love. And Jesus is the ultimate older brother. He is the older brother who reacts to us in a way the father does, not like that older brother did to his son and to his brother. Um, and if we kind of look at the out now around that, which brother are you when you interact with people? Which brother do you um, act like? If you think of the story in, in the New Testament, there's a story of this woman who's caught in adultery and dragged out onto the street and thrown on the street. And these people say, Jesus, she's been caught in adultery. Um, we should stay in her. And um, Jesus says, OK, well, the first person who has sinned, feel free, go ahead. And none of them could, and they all left. And the only person who could was Jesus. Jesus was the only person who could throw a stone. And he says to her, go and sin no more. So there's a forgiveness, but also a call for change. And that's how we come. We come as those who are forgiven. And because of that, we can change because we have something more exciting, more fulfilling. All those things that like the other son or the older son have been looking for in our freedom or our performance, all of them are sourced in that embrace that comes from him. Um, so, we're known and loved and accepted, and that is the out that we're extending to others. Like Chris is in his home, he's extending that unconditional love, that embrace in his home. Okay, we can do that practically, as I say, on the box. We can show just the welcoming, unconditional love of God in very practical ways, like going on a bus with someone, going to a supermarket with someone, some of very practical, embraced ways. Um, also, it's about when we're in that close hug, as I was saying earlier, hearing what God's saying. I just want to encourage you, in your lives right now, and in each one of you, there are people in your lives who God's already working in. There's people in your lives that God's set in your life, and you, you set you in their lives, that you can speak to them and reveal love of the Father, Son, and Spirit to them. And it's not like God feels like it's on the He's already doing it. He's like, please listen to what I'm doing. Okay, come into his embrace and hear. I've got a couple of quick stories. I'm nearly finished, I promise. 
a um, couple of quick stories that are quite fun to hear. So, um, I was convicted. This, this preach has been mainly about me preparing my heart the last couple of weeks. And I was convicted that I hadn't had any fun stories of God's, me speaking to other people, God speaking through me to other people for a while. And a few years ago, I had loads all the time. And I was like, oh, so I did something about that last week. So I've got one cool story from a few years ago and one from this week. So a few years ago, I was working with school and one of the people I was working with, um, I was just praying at the time. I was, it was during the supernatural time, ministry course, so I was thinking about it a lot. And I was like, God, who are you talking to? And brought this girl to mind. Um, just want to do a little disclaimer. It's not all super holy, literally. I said to God, who are you talking to? And I thought about this person. So I was like, okay, let's talk to them. Um, and I said, okay, what are you saying? And just some random thoughts came in my head. And I wrote them down. I spoke to her. It was about how God saw her and around she's into dancing, she kind of did it as a hobby and kind of calling that out in her. She was a Christian, I just said I was praying for her and I felt a few things that didn't make sense. And she's like, yeah, I do, thanks, school. A few years later, um, another friend of mine bumped into her in Tesco and she knew that we knew each other and said, oh, you know, remember me to Dora. Um, I'll never forget that word she said to me. Uh, I then did something, she then applied for a course in dancing because of that. It's like, you know, basically it sh shaped some of what she did. And she not because she didn't believe in Jesus, but she knows somehow that God has had a part in what she does, which is really cool. Um, so that's one thing. Another one, as I said, convicted and done this for a while. So I asked God who you're talking to. One of my colleagues came to mind. I knew she'd been struggling a bit, so I asked her you know, what you wanted to say, and I got a few things. Now, if you want to make it a bit easier on yourself, do what I did. I was a bit out of practice, so I did the easy way out. Make them a card, okay? Everyone likes a card, okay? Write it in a card. Then you don't have to worry about getting your words right in the moment. You've got time to get your words down. And if you're wrong, you give them a card and they've opened it in front of you. So in the moment, you don't know if you're wrong. Just, if you want to tune out a bit, I hide it. It's very encouraging for that. So um, that's what I did. I wrote down this message and um, I gave it to her. And a few days later, so I gave it to her last week, and a few days later, she said that it's had a huge impact on her. And she had no, I had no idea how much she needed to hear it and it was spot on. That's amazing. And it's lovely when that happens. And can I say that doesn't always happen? Sometimes you say to someone, does this make sense? And they go, Ooh. <laughs> that's okay too, because actually it's not about what the right life, it's about what the right extended in our Bible to see the people around me. If you're not sure if it's from God, is it loving? Is it encouraging? Does it feel like an embrace? Great, what's the worst that can happen? You show someone's love, that's, that's a good that worst thing that can happen. Um, or that you're wrong, that's okay too. So, um, yes, as a reminder, there is amazing embrace in heaven. It is no longer closed. We are welcomed into it because of what Jesus has done. No matter where you come from, if you've been Christian for years, as I've been still with him, if you've been Christian in a good way, if you want to come back, if you've never had this before, the embrace is available. All you have to do is ask. Confess to God that what you've done isn't okay. Ask to be part of it, and you're welcome. For some of you, like me, who have been out of practice hearing from God, today is an opportunity you can hear from him again. And expect to. We're about to hear uh, this into a song together. I'm not going to talk during it, I'm going to move away from the mic to get away from the station. And during that time, I encourage you close your eyes and ask God to show you that embrace. For some people, you might just feel at peace. For some people, you might hear Him speaking to you. For you, that is an important relationship. It doesn't just have to be for other people. If you're empty, you've got nothing to get from. So the inn is important. You might be feeling pretty good with God at the moment. It might be six to you for other people as well. That's right. So we're going to listen to this song. And I highly recommend you close your eyes. The lyrics will be up. So if you find it easy to open your eyes, you can just look at lyrics. Um, I'm just going to pray. And then we'll so God, I thank you so much that your embrace is so much better than you can imagine. I pray today that we would encounter your embrace, each person here, that you minister to them in the way they need, and I pray that um, you would speak to us today for people in our lives um, and that it would change 
the outcome of those people's journeys. Um, 